Welcome to Black and Psych, and thank you for coming to our event today. Who is Black and Psych? Black and Psych is a platform to promote visibility, community, and networking opportunities between Black professionals and trainees across the field of psychology. We seek to celebrate, amplify, and support Black voices in psychology and to encourage dialogue around the intersections of psychology, race, social justice, and equity. What we are here for. The Black and Psych organization is founded to one, promote the visibility of Black professionals and trainees in the field of psychology, two, create a community and network of established and aspiring Black psychologists for connection and future collaboration, and three, encourage and hold a space for dialogue around the intersections of psychology, race, social justice, and equity. Who we are here for. Black and Psych is founded to promote visibility, community, and networking opportunities between Black professionals and trainees across the field of psychology, inclusive of all intersectional identities. This is Black and Psych's current team, and you're currently hearing from the current president, Lauren Kendall Brooks. If you're interested in joining our team, please send an email to blackandpsych at gmail.com, visit our website at blackandpsych.org, or follow us on Twitter or Instagram. Also, the QR code listed on the right side of your screen will also take you directly to our website. Thank you, and I hope you would really enjoy today's seminar. So the plan for today, I'd mentioned a little bit earlier, but I'm going to be uh, talking a little bit about logistics, uh, data analysis pipeline, the different steps for the process. I'll give a very short and packed intro to our important data sets. I'm so sorry, we only have two hours today. I can talk, I can, I have given workshops only an introduction to R for two days consecutive, four hours each, like 10 minute breaks. So it's it's a lot, I'm packing in one and I'm so sorry if I don't get to finish it all, um, but I really wanted you to get as much information as possible from this workshop. We'll talk a little bit about reproducibility and what it is and our markdown as a solution for it. Um, data manipulation and wrangling. I'm gonna be going over a couple of functions that you can use normally on your data cleaning. They call it different ways, data manipulation, wrangling, data cleaning, uh, all you need just to clean your data set to do any analysis or reporting, process, uh, or reporting purposes. Then, very quickly, and hopefully if we have time, I'm going to be walking you through two examples of data visualization, basic visualizations, kind of making histograms and scatter plots using ggplot too. So who am I? Uh, my name is Jocelyn Roche Hidalgo. I've been talking for a while now and I should have introduced myself earlier. Um, but I finished my PhD at Georgetown University last year. I graduated this year. Um, I'm currently working at Penn State University as a postdoctoral scientist. Um, I learned R in 2016. That was my first introduction to R. 2015 was my first introduction to Python. I know how to code in other languages, but mainly R has been my chosen preferred language and I've been learning and trying to teach myself how to do R and how can I improve R and add it into my like daily work process and you can do many things in R it, same with Python you can do so many crazy things things that are completely unnecessary but they're kind of fun um, so we'll go over a couple fun things that you can do for data cleaning and data uh, processing uh, but then I'm going to give you a couple of resources that you can take advantage of and see all these crazy things that you can do with R as a language. I do have a Twitter account. I'm very, uh, I used to be more active in there, but I mainly promote the Twitter account because that's where I share most of my R resources or 
cheat sheets or functions or anything I learned that are very cool or opportunities, especially in the uh, academic realm. Uh, so feel free to follow me. I'm going to be talking a bit, little bit about Twitter slash X uh, at the end of the workshop as an opportunity for you to increase your skills in R specifically. And of course, you have my email. You already had my email earlier when I emailed you all with the, um, with the repo link and the survey link. So feel free to reach out for any questions. I'm very happy to answer. Uh, one of the things I love from our community, they're very happy to help and I'm, I'm part of it and I appreciated their help. So I just want to give it back. So happy to talk to anyone. Okay, logistics, uh, provide please non-verbal feedback or raise your hand. Um, feel free to interrupt me. Uh, it would be easier if it's on the chat, honestly, to keep track of them, but feel free to, if there's a burning question to interrupt me or raise your hand so uh, I can answer your questions throughout the workshop. Uh, I really, really appreciate already your non-verbal feedback. It really helps me a lot. It's very hard. You've known with 2020, it's been hard to like know if, People are on the other side actually there. Um, so thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Um, yes, ask any questions to the chat in the Q&A box. I think both of them are active right now. I'm not totally sure. I think so. I've gotten questions in both sides. Uh, either way, check them both. Uh, add questions in either of them. Carla is helping me keep track of them too. Okay, so normally for the data analysis pipeline, this is the usual um, process or the pipeline that you need for your data processing. So you you import your data frame, you, at first you collect your data frame, your data, and you have a data frame, you import it, you tidy it up, you clean it, you, you either do transformations, um, or anything that's necessary for that data set to actually make sense. You visualize them, sometimes you model it, and then you you communicate it. You, you make a report, you make a summary, or write a paper, anything like that. So it's usually the same pipeline that goes over and over again. My goal from this workshop is I'm gonna teach you a little bit about how you can import your data frames in all these different types of data frames. And I'll teach you some of the functions that you can use to tidy up your data set in order for you to be able to visualize it. And I'm gonna show you a tool like Arc Markdown that you can use to communicate um, all of these either analysis or reporting. So that's my plan, very ambitious. We'll see how far we get. Okay, introduction to R and importing data sets. So R, I did ask you in the emails to install two things to your computers. Uh, we won't be able to have live activities or exercises during this workshop because of the time constraints, but I wanted you to still take advantage of this opportunity to finally download them because that's a big step. So download R, that is the programming language. That is the language that you're gonna be using for all data cleaning and analysis kind of like Python, there is Python. That's the programming language. Um, I love R, I'm very biased. I find it very intuitive um, to just learn and figure out um, what to do next and how you can implement it in your own data frames. Uh, there's also a great community of folks who are using it for data science. Um, we're all very excited to welcome you all in the R community and they're very active. Um, uh, they really try to help you and give you all the resources possible. In R, like in many programming languages, there's not only one way to code. There's not only one way to solve your problem with anything. So there's multiple ways that you can do it. Some of them are more efficient than others. Uh, so pretty much their community is like, here's one way you can do it, but here are other 10 ways that you can make that happen um, using these different packages and functions. So they're very, very happy to help you. R Studio is the interactive development environment. That's the IDE. That's where they use R, uh, the language. You, you, you interact with this text editor to write R code. So these are two different things. So 
you cannot really do R Studio without you installing R. You could do R coding, but it looks so ugly and it just makes you no one to do any coding. Um, but R Studio as a tool made it so much more easier for, it, it's very user-friendly. So they really try and they're still trying as a company. Now they're called, they used to be called R Studio company, but now they're called Posit. Uh, as a company, Posit is very much trying to improve the user friendliness um, and make better tools, not only for the R language, but also to combine and, and help with this multilingualism and programming, where you can implement Python languages and R languages and Ruby or Julia and like all in one place so they can communicate to each other, which is very ambitious, um, very helpful especially for people who know one language and it's hard to move on to the other one. So you, you can do it slowly. So once you install R Studio, it will run R in the background, the R language. And you're gonna get something like this. This is screen, whenever you open R Studio, you're gonna get screen that's divided the default into four uh, panels. The top left, that's where the scripts happen. That's where your code goes, where you can run it, where you can keep it. That's where your syntax goes. That's the script section. At the bottom, you can find the console, the terminal, and like it, it would, you can also run code there, but it will disappear. So it's temporary. It's not like if you live in a script and you rerun again, rerun it again. And here you will get all the error messages, you will get um, updates, or if you're installing um, a package, it will show in here, all, like all the activity. On the top right, we have the environment or history. So every time you import a data frame, it will show up in your environment. Uh, all the history, all the things that you do, it will show up here. If you make connections to other data frames or databases, I mean, um, this is another of the tabs that you're gonna you're gonna see that. Uh, you can run Git um, through R, and that's another tab that they have on over there. On the bottom right, you will see where your files are located. If you create plots, that's where it's gonna visualize. Again, that's a default. You can change that in your settings in your own device, um, make that not show up there. But the default is like, you're gonna see those things. And if you create a plot, it's gonna go there. Um, this is a place that you you could manually install your packages. Uh, there's a tab called packages. Um, so you can go um, and take advantage of, of all the resources that people mm, what can I say? So whenever someone creates a package, they also make documentation. And we we are we're trying as a community to be very helpful. So we're encouraging package developers to also have good documentations just because they do code. And it's like, I don't know how to use it. Like it's worthless if you don't teach me well how to use it. So they're very much trying to do it. So help. And packages section, that's where you will find more information about the different packages. And if you export a, a other objects, uh, it will go into viewer. Like if I make a PowerPoint, um, kind of like the PowerPoints that you see right now, I made all these PowerPoints that you're gonna see today using R in R language. Um, so whenever I wanted to see, how it's looking, it will go to this panel over here. Okay, let's see. Whenever you open your R Studio, you can create so many different types of files uh, that you could create using the R Studio interface. So there's the R script, quarter document, quarter presentation. Those are a new product from Posit to make it even more user-friendly. And I love it, but that's not the purpose of this specific uh, workshop. And if you have the time to explore what Corto is, I'll so ha highly suggest it. You can make a slides like the one I have, you can make a blogs, your own website. Um, you can make reports. Um, yeah, like they do quite a bit of things in now. It, it, it's not like they're using a new, programming language, 
they're, they really try to make it more user friendly. So it's more like clicking and drop down menus and things like that. So you can you can even explore one by one and see what they do. Honestly, that's what I did at the very beginning because I had no idea what I was doing. And I just wanted to see what happened. <laughs> but again, they really try to make it user friendly. So many of these have, as soon as you open, create one, it comes with a template that you can just explore and see, oh, this is how it's supposed to be. And now I'm gonna replace this section with what I actually need because I don't care about what the content is right here. Um, but it does come up with a with a template at the very beginning. There are two main files that you usually work with um, for data science, at least from uh, in academia mainly. Uh, you can use the R scripts files. And if you go back, that would be the very first one that you see when whenever you go to a new file. And that one is, is a script, it, it's, it's a window that shows up and assumes that everything that is inside that page is executable R code. Uh, if it's not commented out, it will assume that that's code. So if I don't do the hashtag to make it a comment, like in this section over here, um, R will be like, yeah, that's a code. We'll try to run it and then we'll yell at you because there's no code. There's no function that's called this is a comment. Um, and there's spaces everywhere. So it's just not gonna like it. It's not gonna run anything. So you have to comment it out um, because it assumes that everything in that document, that R document, it will, it's code. So this is for sure code. So it will run that, but this is not. So I have to comment it by adding the hashtag. R markdown files or <laughs> extension would be that RMD. Uh, this one is actually, it's a document that assumes everything to be text, like it's the completely opposite, unless you insert a code chunk. And I'm gonna teach you a little bit more about what code chunks are, but the .r scripts are, it, the default is that everything in here is code. For the RMD, the default is everything in here is text, unless you tell me it's code. So. Those are the main differences of those two. And they also look different if you um, open in your computer. So whenever you create an R script, um, this is really much what you're gonna see in here. This is, you, you get this white page over here that the assumption is that everything in here is code. So for R to, for you to be able to run coding R in Windows computers, you can, select the whole code or the whole line of code if you want to and do control plus enter on Windows or command enter on Max. You do not have to select the whole code. Like some languages like Python, even SPSS, like if you don't, or Stata even, if you don't select the whole thing, it's not gonna run the whole thing or the whole line of code. With R, it's like, I, it just needs the cursor to be anywhere in that line of code and then you can do command enter or control enter, and then you'll be able to actually run the code. Like it doesn't mean you don't have to select all the time. That's one of the things I normally have with my students. Like they really try to select everything. I'm like, you don't have to, just need to move your cursor somewhere, beginning, in between, at the end, um, and it will run it. Like I mentioned earlier, in R or R Markdown, you can write yourself comments. Um, you by doing the hashtag or pound sign, anything after that symbol is it becomes a comment. It goes from a very dark color to more of a grayish color. And that's kind of a sign for you to know like, oh, you commented up. I also know that you can select the whole thing and do command shift C, I think, and it will comment it make it a comment, whatever you selected. There's a lot of shortcuts. You just need to look at your devices because I always get confused with the Windows and Macs. Um, please write comments. I'm, I'm going to repeat this many times. This is one of the things that I need you, if, if you need to remember something from this workshop is please write comments for yourself, um, for others, anytime that you're writing co code. I don't care if it's an R. If you decide to move on to Python 
please do yourself a favor and write as many comments as possible explaining why you did the things you did in your code and explaining your future self like this is this this was important because of this like why did i remove that one subject it would have been nice to have a comment about it uh, I mentioned the word packages earlier. So R comes with a base R language. So it's, by default, it comes with a base language that it is more intuitive than other languages, but it's not that intuitive or it's not that user-friendly if you don't know any programming. So what people have done in the community have been to create packages that make it easier for you to use the base R language um, and it's more intuitive, for example, summarize function inside the package deployer. It does what you think it does. It summarizes your data frame. Um, same with rearrange. It rearranges your data frame. So they really try to make it more intuitive and they create functions that are embedded in these packages that they practically make for free and then they submit it to this place called C run, which is uh, kind of like the archive of packages in R uh, and you can install them from them directly. So you can use actual like syntax in your code to be at the beginning of your, whenever you're sharing your code with anyone and be like, you cannot just assume that they will have these packages installed already. So you will add install that packages. This is a function and the, fun the package that you are supposed to be installing. Jocelyn, we yes. have a question. Um, someone's asking, what is a package? Yes, so a package is um, it's a it's a, an agglomeration of functions. Um, so the functions are um, it, like like month like some mean standard deviation like rearrange pivot. Um, it's like shortcuts to a whole like code in the background that you don't necessarily have to learn how to do it. So it's a, there's a shorter version that it has hidden um, function in, in the back. You just need to call that shorter version. Um, and a group of those are in those packages that they create. And the, a package has those functions. They also have documentation, kind of like manuals and examples of what how, how to use that specific function. So one function that we're gonna use, or oh, one package that it's normally used for data cleaning, it's dplyr, it's D-P-L-Y-R. Uh, that package has a lot of functions that are mainly to clean your data frame. You can mutate new columns, select columns, filter rows, um, and those filter, just that function word, has in the background a lot of code that is running it but we don't have to do all that whole background code we just need to call the shortened version which is select and it will do what we wanted it to do select the columns did that answer the question was that talk too convoluted anonymous participant um I think that was good. I'm also going to write a version of that in the chat so people can look back at it. Thank you, appreciate it. Whenever you're writing this function called install packages in your code, uh, you have to put the name of the package in quotation marks. That's the one thing that's very annoying with R, and I think it's very annoying with other languages too, is like sometimes you need quotation marks, sometimes you don't, and you live and learn. It's messing up. You're like, yeah, I should have put it in quotation marks. You could read the documentation. Sometimes it's very hidden and you don't really see it. In this case, you do need the quotation marks. And in the future, in the loading library function, you see that you don't need it for some reason. So I'll, I'll show you. So you need to install your packages once in your computer. That's it. Only once. You may need to update it every time that they do any updates. Um, just a heads up, 
be always like with any updates, even with your phone devices. Like if you rely on a specific function or in specific way something is working and you update it, you need to be informed about what those updates, um, what are those? Uh, are they going to affect the function? Are they going to affect whatever you did in your code? It, it has happened with collaborations before that we use functions that are now deprecated. So when we updated the packages, the functions didn't work anymore. Um, we shouldn't have updated it in the first place. Or now we need to replace those functions for the non-deprecated versions. And that took a while. Um, so just just a heads up to always like you always think no, not always, but maybe you usually think that it will be better for you to to uh, update it because you will have the most current thing. Yeah, it 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 is good, but if your code relies on older versions, you may break your code already. So once you install it. Uh, there is also another way that you can install it, not just using syntax. You can go to the bottom right section of your screen in RStudio or Markdown, go to Packages, and then click Install. And then you look for the package that you're trying to install in your computer. Again, you only have to install that package once in your computer, um, and not again unless you need to update it. So in, I think in my example, I, which one did I do? Cow something. So I went to packages and then I look for the package cowbell and I install it. And then it shows up in my library. I have too many packages downloaded currently in my computer. So, just because you have the package installed on your computer doesn't mean that it will call the functions right away for you to do any data cleaning. You need to load them into your syntax, either your RMD or your R file, um, for you to be able to use its functions. Otherwise, the default is like you're just using R base. And R base can be very annoying, so you don't want to use that sometimes. So for example, if I wanted to use the functions that come in the package tidyverse or scheme R, I need to load those libraries in my script. So I'm gonna use a function library and in parentheses, I'm gonna type the name of the package that I want to use its functions from. With the difference of the inst installation, you have to load these libraries once per session for you to be able to use the functions. Just because you load them yesterday and you closed it, and now you're starting a new se session today, it may not work. Jocelyn, we have a quick question. Um, so one person is asking, uh, so Kim is asking, is this the view of the R with Studio? I took a conference seminar for R. The screen we were shown was all black with uh, colored lettering. Would that be R base? Uh, R base, uh, no, it, R base was the, the font was, it's black and it's not that pretty to look at, honestly. Um, but it doesn't look different. What, what you were, are describing is like someone in the workshop changed their settings on how to see their code. And that that's what you saw. Um, I try my best to keep it. I like, I uninstall everything and install it again, because this is how you will see if you install it newly in your computer. Um, because I do sometimes change my, the way I want to look at it. And I want it black with rainbow font sometimes. Sometimes I just want it turquoise with you can change all of that in your settings and how you want to see your screen. You can change the order of those panels that you saw earlier that I told you the top right, this is what you're going to see environment. You could manually go into your settings in your R studio and say, I don't want to see on the top right anymore. I want to see on the top bottom or I want to see it to the left. You can change all of that in the settings. Um, yeah, when I give workshops, I, I revert all of that back so you can see what you will see if you install recently R. I have this very quick thing. I'm not doing very well with time, so I'm so sorry. Uh, but I have this very quick question that I had for you all. 
um, before I teach you how to import data, uh, data frames. What kind of files type do you deal with the most in your work? I'm pretty sure I, yes, I'm getting responses already. Um, we'll set up for two minutes. Um, see which one is the most common one. So the options, and you see on your screen, uh, the options are, maybe I can, no, I'm not gonna put it until the solutions, but the options are CSV, come separated values, Excel files, JSON files, XML files, SPSS files, and SAS files. I forgot to put Stata files. Oh no, I did it. Just no one is responding to that. So Stata files is another one and SQLite databases is another one. Well, the winner is Excel files, that's very common. And then second place is CSVs, and then third place is SPSS. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, yeah, those are very common. I'm glad that they're here because then I can teach you how to import those files since those are the ones that you use the most. To import data frames, uh, you use different packages um, to, so for you to be able to use those functions that allow you to import that data frame into the R environment. So you can do data manipulation, analysis, et cetera. So one of the packages for R, for, uh, for CSV, for example, is the package read R or reader. I never know how they pronounce it. Uh, so this package, what it does is that you can you can load it to your computer and then use the function read underscore CSV, and then you enter the CSV that you're trying to read it, and it will load into your environment, into your R environment workplace right now, and you'll be able to manipulate those variables. You can also import uh, CSV files using base R. Um, base R uses the function read period, period CSV. Read R uses read underscore CSVs. The main difference is how they handle the variables when they're imported. So for example, if my variable is called H group, um, there's a space in between that. When I import it into R, read period CSV will read that space and will give it a period. So it will be H period group. If I use read, oh, if I use read underscore CSV, then it's gonna be an underscore. So if I do read underscore CSV, now my H space group will be H underscore group. That's one of the differences between those two. Uh, it always confuses people. It's like, why is the period? Why is the space? It's just because they're under two different packages, and that it's possible sometimes that. Uh, you may have conflicts because two packages decided to call the same function, or not the same function, but they decided to call a function the same way, but they don't do the same thing, or at least they're very close to each other that confuses people. Uh, so always read the documentation to make sure like it's doing what you think it's supposed to be doing. Okay. Uh, before we move on to the other data frames, I want to walk through like what this syntax means. Um, this code construction is exceedingly uh, common in R. Uh, so I want to spend a few minutes exploring it together so we can see the anatomy of what it, the code will look like in R. Justin, we have a quick question. Yes. Um, does it matter if it's a period or underscore? It, it, it doesn't, like you can choose whatever you like, how it's gonna choose your data, your variables. Like if if my Excel file, for example, I keep putting my variables names with the spaces, I need to make a decision as the data scientist to like, how do I want R to, to handle those spaces? Do I want them to be periods or do I want them to be, it's preference or underscores. I prefer underscores, I, 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 it's easier for me to see them and I don't, miss a period uh, but some people really like the periods and so they don't like the underscore that's very much preference and how they want the variables to be i don't care which type of format you use as long as you're consistent 
So if you, all your variables are handling the spaces in one way, fantastic. I don't care if it's with underscore, doubles, underscore, a hyphen, not hyphen. Um, as long as you're consistent, it will make your life so much easier and whoever uses your code. So this is normally what codes will look like in R. Uh, you will have a function that is what it, the one that does stuff. Um, are, these are defined in the packages, which are the agglomeration of functions. Um, we load the tidyverse package right now in our workshop in order to be able to use the function read underscore CSV function. Then, Inside those parentheses of this function, we have an input. The input that goes into a function is called an argument. Um, so you, you will see it sometimes being referred to an argument. So the argument to a function gets put in parentheses. A function can have zero, one, or many arguments. You have to read the documentation to make sure you're using the functions the correct way. If there is more than one argument, then you will use commas to separate it. Um, you'll see some examples later on. But in this case, you only need to put one. The read underscore CSV, in parentheses, and inside of the parentheses, you put the argument, in this case, is the name of the file we're trying to import. On the very left side, uh, data underscore frame, it's called an object. This is the output. This is what stores the output of whatever my function is doing. So the read underscore CSV function outputs a data frame. So think of a table. Um, but if we want to capture that data frame inside of a name object, so if I want to clean it later on, we need to specify that explicitly. Otherwise, it's in the limbo of like, you import it, but it's not assigned to anything, so I cannot call it again because you didn't assign it to anything. So it's a great idea to capture the output of a function in an object so it can be used as the input for other functions. So if I capture it as a data underscore frame, then if I want to do something with that later on, I don't have to import my CSV again. I can just call data underscore frame and I will have the data frame already in the R environment. And in between those two, you notice like a little arrow going to the left. This is called an assignment operator. This is the one that will allow you to assign something to that object. And is that arrow, arrow it's always pointing to the left to the object, um, which is just a smaller dan sign followed by a dash or a minus. Uh, some people call it gets, like they read it like data frame, gets, read underscore CSV. I never understood that, but you may hear in other workshops. I don't like it. Um, I just, I don't, it doesn't, it doesn't click. But that's what the error is doing. It's whatever the output of that function is being assigned to that object called data underscore frame. And you can assign it into anything. I can call it potato. And my data frame now from now on is going to be called potato. And that's what I'm going to call it all the time. So you, you can choose the naming up to you. Um, OK, let's quick. What questions do you have so far, if I haven't answered them already? Going back to the importing data frames, you can also import the data frames from Excel. Most of you are using Excel. And sometimes, sometimes some computers are very weird with some packages. Um, our read Excel has been the package that has given me the most problems importing any data frame in terms of systems. So it works fantastic in my Mac. And then I go to the PC in my lab and it no longer works for some reason that I don't know. Um, so sometimes it's been easier for me to just go to my Excel, export it, whatever it's in there into CSV and just use that CSV. It works, I promise. I just, uh, I'm not very good with PCs. I haven't used a PC in so long. It's just like, I quit very quickly. But you can use a package called Read Excel. Um, they've been working very hard to fix whatever issues they've had. Uh, in, this, in this package, Read Excel, you use the function read underscore Excel, and then you enter your file in there. Um, so you can use that. Uh, read Excel is part of the package of Tidyverse. Tidyverse, it's quite a unique package compared to the other ones, which makes everything so much confusing. The way I say Tidyverse, it's a package of packages. So when you install Tidyverse, you install multiple packages and each package has their own functions. 
uh, you normally don't have packages of packages, but in this case, Tidyverse does. Um, so if you install Tidyverse in your computer and you load Tidyverse, you will automatically have a read Excel loaded into your session. You can also load JSON files um, into your uh, R, R Studio or workspace using the, the library or the package called JSON Lite using from JSON function. Uh, you see the format is very similar. You have the function and inside of the function, you tell the path where the file is. You can also insert uh, or import XML files with using the package XML. You can import SVSS files directly using the package Haven. Haven is actually going to allow you to import many other types of packages, not just SVSS. So that CSV files can be imported using Haven. SAS files can be using Haven. And Stata files can be using Haven as well. And the functions, of course, are slightly different. So you use read underscore DTA because that's extension for Stata. For SAS is read underscore SAS, and for SPSS is read underscore SAV or SAF. So those are the different files. You can put in many more with other packages. I just never had to need to do it, so I don't know them. But I know you can import other, uh, other files in there. You can also connect R or your R workspace uh, with multiple databases. Um, it's very common now. People have been using SQL and SQLite and post, um, like post GRE SQL. I think that's what it's called. Uh, but you can you you can connect your R workspace with these databases, um, so you're able to do some analysis directly in your R Studio workspace. You, for example, for SQLite databases, you can use two libraries. Or two packages, the DBI and the RSQ Lite, RSQ uh, to import uh, those uh, databases. Okay, trying to rush through here. We have one hour. So R is very case sensitive. I don't know how other languages can be, but most of programming languages are very case sensitive. R is very picky. So always choose one of the followings for objects or variables and please be consistent. Like you, it's up to you how you want to label your variables, but think of yourself in the future and think of others if they want to use your code, like will they be able to understand what's going on and is there a pattern that they can replicate if they create new variables. There's they the R community, I think is our community that label these things, but they come up with names for these different types of cases for how to call the variables. So there is a snake underscore case, the camel case, and periods in names. What they do is just everything is lowercase. I did it again. Everything is lowercase with an underscore in between each word, camel case, eh. The beginning, the first letter of the words inside the variable are capitalized, the rest are lowercase, and period in names, as the name says, it's period between words. Um, so the directories, uh, if the data file in the word it's in the working directory, um, some the default usually is that when wherever you save your RMD file or your R file, that can become your work directory. And you'll see it in the top bottom panel that says files, um, where directory, where your file is. See, if you're importing a data frame, if your R script is in the folder where your data frame you're trying to import is, then you will just need to call the name. If it's not, then you have to actually write the whole path of where it's located. So you just figure out find the path of where that data frame is, in, insert it here, and then you can import the file. So yeah, using RStudio project sets your working directory to the folder where your project lives. So you only need to specify the location relative to that. And I think that's a lot helpful. Um, and it's kind of like a, a bubble on our project, which you can open, it's just a bubble that will automatically give your work um, a working directory. Once you import your data frame or any kind of those data frames into R, it will show up in your environment panel here. It will just pop show up here. And I'm gonna show you whenever I'm writing the report. 
whenever you don't know what a function does and how it works, you can always put a question mark at the beginning of that function without the parentheses and run it, and it will show you the documentation that whoever created that function or that package should have created for you. And you will see what each of the terms mean, which ones you have to actually have to put something or which ones you can ignore. Uh, it will give you examples that you can run. Um, so that's one of the parts of adding that question mark. Is it will help you get to that documentation and help. So very quick recap, uh, packages, extended functionality of R, they need to be installed once per computer and loaded each session. Some packages can be found in CRAN. This is the archive network where all the packages are. And some need to be manually activated or installed to your device from GitHub repos or other sites. Most of them are coming from CRAN. And I, I always recommend CRAN is very, very hardcore. <laughs> They're very picky and the expectations are very high in order for them to get accepted into CRAN. So I I could create a package and it could be very not good. It will never be accepted for CRAN. It will work, but it, they have standards that you have to meet. Um, so try your best to install the packages directly from CRAN instead of the random repos unless you need something from a specific function from them. So functions do stuff, uh, they're like the verbs. They accept arguments to define parameters um, and we can store the output of those functions in objects using the assignment operator, which was the arrow pointing left. When you import the data, uh, this is the first step for data analysis uh, pipeline. So read underscore CSV is a function from the tidyverse that we can use to import data. And you saw all these other packages and libraries that you can use to import these other types of data frames. Okay, what questions do you have so far? Hi, I did have a question. Um, will you be going over some of the basic functions? I think you mentioned a couple of them, but just, I mean, not that we'll <laughs> be able to get a lot of it, but just kind of a, yes. yeah. Thanks. Yes, thank you. Yes, I'll definitely be going over those. So reproducibility very quickly for run out of time. Uh, one of the most powerful aspects of working in the R environment is the ability to conduct reproducible data analysis and data cleaning. Like what it means is like those analysis and processes that can be shared, revised or purpose and reproduced uh, by others and even yourself in the future. So point and click is not reproducible unless the interactive tool you're using also records those actions. I wanted to give a shout out to Jamovi and Jasp. Um, if you're very new, you have a lot of experience with SPSS and dragging and pointing and everything, Jamovi is a wonderful alternative to beginners of R. Um, it, the interface looks like SPSS, even choosing and clicking and everything is like very similar to SPSS, which is fantastic. Like that was one of the things I used with my PI to help her transition to R when I was in, my, in grad school, um, because it was very similar to what SPSS is. What is great about your movie is that it keeps track of all those pointing and clicking and selecting that you normally wouldn't with SPSS. Uh, and that way she can export the background R code to do whatever she needed to do. And I will have access to the raw R code. And so I can reproduce whatever she did a lot easier, um, keeping track of all those clicks and uh, selections. So if you're very new and you wanna do data analysis when R and you're too afraid to start coding how to do like a t-test or even just to do basic graphs, you can go into Jamovi, install it in your computer, and it uh, uses R as a background. It's free. Um, it's very much you select your variable, you click it, you drop your variable into the other box. And if you want a scatter plot, you drop it in that box, and you want the white axis into the other box. And it's very, very user friendly. And then at the end, you can just export the R code in the background. And so you will have the R code, so you can reproduce it again, and you can figure out a lot easier how to make those happen. So Jamovi and Jasp are wonderful alternative. And you can do great stuff, like great statistics, like Bayesian stats, multi-level analysis. So it's not just basic stats. But it doesn't always help other. 
Sometimes, most times, it helps you. Uh, consider the following statements and ask yourself if they sound familiar. Can I redo the analysis from last month with this month's data? Usually, sometimes, if you answer no to that, it's like you were not thinking of your future self. Um, why did the, the data on table X not seem to agree with figure X? Why did I decide to omit those 10 rows from my analysis? That's a common one that I am still learning <laughs> to keep comments to myself. Why did I recode these variables this way? That's also a common one for many grad students and undergraduate students, anyone who uses data. Um, but why did I do it this way? And if you don't write comments for yourself or even like the code for how you did that way, um, it, it just doesn't help otherwise. Uh, another question I normally, uh, people get fam familiar with, it's like, which test did my PI supervisor suggest to run and which ones did I come up with instead? Um, to keep track of all the steps that you're doing for data analysis. Uh, just remember your closest collaborator is you from last month or last week. So you can do yourself a huge favor by using tools that promote reproducibility. And one tool that we can use for that is ARC Markdown. And ARC Markdown, or that RMD file, I'll show you a little bit earlier, it's a type of file in RStudio that you can open and create stuff, uh, code and text. It gives you tools to tackle reproducibility problem and allows you to have like a combination of narrative annotations and code in the same place. Uh, it's very helpful. I do this a lot, especially thinking of my RAs who have no background in R, but I really want them to do things in a specific order in terms of data cleaning. So I can give the kind of like a recipe. You do this first, and then you do this other one, and there's code attached to them. Sometimes there is no code at all. Sometimes there's a graph that creates automatically to give them like if they're being reliable or um, in terms of data video coding. So when you import or when you create an ARC Markdown file, uh, this is normally the format that you get. You get the very top, it's called the YAML section. Um, then you get code chunks and then text. Uh, this is a, another easier way to see it. So you will see this, the YAML section is also called the header. This is where you put your title, author names, and what kind of output you want. And in, you can write text with different marks and you can write actual code chunks with actual code inside of them. And this is what I'm going to be showing you very quickly how to do them. So when you need or when you export these files, you create a, you can create a PDF, a Word doc, an HTML um, document that is ready for you to share with anyone. Uh, you can also create PowerPoints out of um, Arc Markdown, and you can also create dashboards. So this is what the code will look like on the top, on the left of how the R Markdown raw file will look like. And whenever I export it, you will get something like this out of this code. So it's very like report-like looking and it's really a lot easier for you to share with someone if they want like very simple descriptives or if they want to know a preliminary finding, but you can have that already set for you. A kind of there are some rules for the text in terms of R markdown. If you want to do the like the actual text portion of the report, uh, if you put words in between two quotation marks, um, then it will make them bold. If you put one asterisk, no, it wasn't quotation mark. It was asterisk. If you put one asterisk in between the words, it makes them uh, italics. If you want to create headers. And uh, you use the hashtag space. And the if you just use one, it becomes the first level. You use two, the second level, and so on. You can create lists. So you can have the dash space, and it will create a bulleted list. You can have one a numeric. It could be like, I can put 99 point a space, and it will number automatically to from one to whatever. These code chunks, this is where I will be putting the code. This is where I will be putting R to like create a ggplot, for example. Um, all the code will go in there. So when I export it, I will get something like this. And whenever I, I deal with my PI, she doesn't really care how I've made that graph. She just wants to see the graph. 
So I can hide the code from her whenever I export it. And she only sees the graph in my report. And hopefully I'm going to show you that very quickly in a little bit. Uh, you can insert the code chunks by going to this top section over here of an RMD file. And you see it says RMD there. Uh, and then insert R. You can insert other code chunks. So if I, if I don't know how to do this in R and I know I'm Python, I can just choose Python and use my, my knowledge in that chunk. And it will do whatever I tell it to do. Um, that's pretty much what the sections would be. You can also use like this shortcuts, command option I and control alt I. I always forget those. So I just do it manually. And I've been using it forever and I still forget. At the very top, every time you create an RMD file, there is this special code chunk on the very top and it's like, why is it there? So what you can do is, and here I give a global rule for your code chunks. So if I don't want my collaborator to see any of my code for any of the code chunks in my report, I can tell it here, like, do not show the code, just give me the output. So when I export my report, I never see the code. Uh, it runs and shows me only the output, which is what I wanted. I can override that rule in specific code chunks, but it's a lot easier. So I don't have to do it every single time. Uh, just put in the global box over there. And it always creates that little chunk at the beginning of every, every time you create an RMD file. I'm sorry, I'm running so I can show you the actual functions. But if you have questions, you can put them in the chat. I see, is it possible to export RStudio code or R Markdown into each other? So RStudio is the interface where you're gonna be doing R Markdown, where, where you're gonna be using the R Markdown file. So in the RStudio interface, um, what is it? Okay, here's one. So all of this is an RStudio interface. This is specific file over here. It's an RMD that I created in this interface. And that's the one that RMD file is the one that I'm needing or exporting. I don't know why they call it need to. Okay, data manipulation so we can actually go through the fun stuff. Uh, remember this slide at the beginning of the workshop where I asked you to fill out the survey, build to build our data set. So I downloaded that into our data folder so I can show you very quickly like to do some manipulation to that code. So our data set for today had 12 variables that we could clean. You can see like whatever Google Sheets exported is like so long. Uh, it really literally copy and pasted everything I asked in those questions, which is not great for a variable name. So we'll rename those variables into shorter versions that have a consistent format, which is uh, underscore in between words. We will use the package from tidyverse. Um, we'll use this syntax. Normally, as you call a data frame, then this is the call the pipe. Then you tell it to do something. So in this case, I'm telling it to do a cross tab of age and education. So you only need to call your data frame once in this type of syntax, the tidyverse syntax. And you use the pipes to chain those uh, steps. So think of like, I call my data frame, then I tell it to do step one, then I tell it to do step two, and then I tell it to do step three. Kind of like that's how you will read the code. Uh, so in this case, for example, I'm going to call the data frame called data. I, again, I could call it potato data, then I'm going to filter all the rows for people who are younger than 25. Then I'm going to do this summary group by education, the education variable. So in this summary, I want you to calculate, I want to calculate the mean of those are younger than 25 group by education level. So I'm going to have the less than high school, the average gestation length, more than high school gestation length. So that's the like that's the order. You're telling it to do in specific order. And those pipes with the percent more than percent, it's pretty much saying the word then. You can add the pipe using command shift M or control shift M for Windows. 
questions so far. Okay, so I'll, what I'm going to do, I'm going to walk you through an R file, our RMD file with the code and functions that can help us clean our data frame. Let me find where my data frame is first. So I just downloaded that data from pushing it to GitHub so you have access to it. Okay, so this is an RMD file. So what I did to get here, I went to files, new files, arc markdown, and I click it and I told it, I'm gonna call it ha ha ha, I wanted to import as a PDF want my name to show up, and I want to use the current date. Every time I render it, it will update it, the date. Like you can see, you can use other templates like presentations, you can create a dashboard, or if you import the right packages, you can have templates. Uh, Papaja, for example, which I have here, uh, it has a template for a APA formatted manuscript. So I just go on copy and paste pretty much from whatever I was working in my manuscript, and I already have it set up kind of like that format. So I'm just gonna go with a regular PDF doc, and it will create this as a default. You see it has a template for an RMD, what it would look like. This is the global chunk that I told you about. This is the text. These are the code chunks in R that I told you that a function is doing something. So if I export this one, that is, it will ask you to save it. I'm gonna save it to my desktop. So let's export it. The first time you export, it will give you an error. Follow the instructions that you see in your console. Uh, sometimes you need to install something else to your computer, but it should create this PDF format of a report. So you you see the output, I created a plot, it was showing there, you didn't see here, things like that. So in, for our data frame, what I'm gonna do step-by-step, step, um, I added the title of my report. This is the intro to our workshop activity. Uh, I'm gonna make a PDF document. I created a, a global, I'm gonna actually make it true so you can see the code every time I export. And every time I save, I'm gonna need it so you see it. Uh, very quickly, I was I work in developmental science, so I was with children. I work with children like from four to six, and it helped me come up with some fun questions, like the superpower questions. So I hope you appreciate them. Um, but we're gonna be using both the demographics and the fun questions today. So first, you will need to load your packages. We're gonna use two packages in this exercise. I'm gonna use the tidyverse package and the janitor package. I happen to already have them installed on my computer. If you've never had them installed on your computer, go to packages, install, and then look for them and install them. Same with janitor. A bit picky and just select them and then install them. I already have them installed. If I do this, it's gonna tell me to update. Oh, it didn't reinstall it. I promise I already had it. But I'm gonna, again, install it to my computer once. I never have to do it again, unless I somehow delete R Studio and R from my computer. But this is a new session, so I'm gonna load the package tidyverse. So I'm gonna use the function library. Let me see. Maybe that will be easier for you to see. So I'm going to use the function library to load the package tidyverse. You see it done. I need to do that. Now I'm going to do the library library editor. Like you see, I didn't need to select the whole thing. I just need to put a cursor somewhere. And since I have a Mac, I did a command return to run that library code chunk. If I wanted to run this whole chunk, the whole like grayish box, I can select this guy over here. I don't know if it says run current chunk. It will run all the content in that chunk. 
the other arrow pointing down, it rounds all the chunks above this one, all the way until that line before it. I don't even know if I have other chunks. Oh, I do. But I'll run that. So I have both of my packages loaded. Um, we're gonna import our data set first. I have my data set in a CSV format. So in theory, we could imp we could have imported the Google Sheet directly to R. That is possible, and there is a package for that. But for simplicity and lack of time, I downloaded the responses as a CSV. I save them into my folder called data, and I call it data CSV. I was not very creative, uh, but that's the one I'm going to import. So I'm going to use the function read underscore CSV. That one is coming from the tidyverse package. Um, and I'm going to call, I'm going to give the path of where that is. Right now, it's inside the folder data. So I'm going to run it. Um, if I check on the environment, and I should have, I should have, I'm going to delete this so you see it here because it was covering it. But every time you import and you assign it to an object, it will show up there. Pop. We imported data and that object is called data. And I can call it potato. And potato is there. If I don't do this, if I don't assign it to an object and run the code, it runs. It does it. it you can see it here. But it will not create it in the environment, so you won't be able to access it for you to be able to manipulate the data inside of it. So you need to assign whatever you import into an object. I'm going to call it data again. I'm not creative. So you check the environment, and it's there. You can even click on it, and you can see very quickly that data frame that we, we created together. Again, I do not like the variable names. These are terrible. The likelihood I'm going to make write a typo somewhere here and misspell something is so high. I just, this is bad. So we're going to clean and rename these variables. So these variable names are too long and we need to rename them. So I'm going to use the function rename. But first, I'm going to use the function janitor or the package janitor. I'm going to use the function clean names and I'm going to re-import my data frame so you can see what this function does it automatically uses the default of that function to clean the names of my variables. So you saw how crazy there's a comma, question marks, multiple spaces, there's even parentheses. So let me run this again. Um, let's check it out. So now all of it is in lowercase, all um, non-letters, all characters that are non-letters or numbers were replaced by an underscore. So there's no more question marks, there's no parentheses, there's nothing. So it's more like a consistent pattern in my variable. So now it, it makes a little bit more sense. Consistency is key. You could specify other types of name types, like the camel case. Um, so you can go to help, look for clean names, that's the function. You find it and you have you see the description of it, documentation, some examples that you can use. These are the other types of uh, cleaning that you can use in your own uh, data frames, like lower underscore camel, upper camel, and there's like more options that you can use. I can make them all title case. You can choose. I just go with the default of making them all lowercase and separated by underscores with no characters. There are no letters or numbers. So I'm gonna rename these names now. They're they're annoying. Like if if I use this function called call names, this is an R based function into my data frame, you see in your console here all the names for my data frame. They're still too long, even though they're cleaner, they're like gigantic, I'm gonna mess up. So what I'm gonna do is, 
I'm going to use the function rename. And in the function rename, what I want you to do is like put the new name equal the old name. I hate that. I always get it wrong and then I get an error and I do it. I flip it. So you first you put the name you wanted and then you put the name that you don't want or that the old name. So I did that with every single one of them. So the question of how many books have you read so far this 2023 became books underscore 2023 to make it better. What is your gender became gender. Which state do you currently reside in became state. So if I run this and assign it to my, my object data, I'll overwrite it. So now my data frame will have those names using the function rename. Okay, let's see. So now let's separate the demo questions and the fun questions into two data frames. This is sometimes you need to select the specific variables and sometimes you don't need them all. Um, so we're going to use the function select. And there's a couple ways that we can do this. We can assign the fun questions to a data frame called fun underscore data and the demo questions into the demo underscore data. I can do it by selecting each one of them individually, I run them. And you see here, I will have selected these two. Oh, but that sounds like a lot of work that I have to do for every single one of them. So another way is that I can write a range. I can select the function select, all the columns from H underscore group all the way to Latin status. If I do that, I'll select a range of columns. Another way that you can do it, and that's I think that's the way I decided to do at the end, oh, is I'm going to select, oh, I think I did something. Oh, there it is. I'm going to select the range of H underscore group all the way to the end. And that's what this one does, this last column. So from age group all the way to the end. So if I go to my data frame, I should select everything from age group all the way to the end, which is the same, it happens to be the same as the other way. So if I run that, I should have the same range. So let's choose one way. So I'm gonna select the demo data, which is from age group to Latin status, I'm gonna call it demo underscore data. You see here, it created a new data frame with five variables. You select the five variables that you needed um, from a specific range. You can use the minus and C. What C in parentheses does is it's a list. So I'm telling you here, select this list of variables. Actually, everything minus this list of variables. So what that's going to do, it's going to select all the variables if I go, that are not the demographic uh, variables. If they're not in order, you will have to select them manually one by one, or you can select one variable and then there is a range and then another variable, and then there is another range. They just happen to be next to each other. Um, yeah, it, it happens sometimes that it's like you want to select three of them, and one is at the beginning, and the other one's at the end, and one is in the middle. You just have to manually select each one of them. So we can count the number of people grouped by age and gender from our data frame. Uh, we can use the function group by and the function count. This function, what it does is it tells me that you're going to do whatever you're telling it to do after that pi, but group it by these variables. So if I comment this, I'm going to do they, I'm going to call my data frame. Then I'm going to group it by age group and gender. And I want you to count those rows. So if I run it like that, then I will have age group, gender, and the count. So females from the ages of 18 and 24, there's 31 of you. Females from 25 to 34, there's 23 of you. Out of people who prefer not to say, 
there's three of them and they're all 35 to 44. So, oh, that's one way you can do it. You can also change the order of how you saw those things. So I did age group and gender. So you say age group and gender, but I could have done gender and age group. So I, it's a lot easier for me to see these gender categories and like, oh, non-binary, there's only one age group and there's three of them. We can make a PDF ready table using the package GT. So if you load and install the package GT, then after you do whatever you code of the counting, whatever, you can then just type GT at the end. Oh, I've deleted the parentheses. Oh, it will create a table ready um, formatting table, I guess that's cool. Uh, so whenever I need to, Use, it looks prettier when it's exported as a PDF, but it may take a while because I'm on board. So whenever I exported it, this is what I have so far for this report. I have the code because I told it to show me the codes. I have the outputs. I have the table that told you that it makes it a prettier table, that's a, that's a lot better than what it was originally without the GT. Without the GT was this kind of boring thing. Jocelyn, we have a quick question. Um, so someone has asked, what if the variables you want to select are not in order? How would you efficiently select them? Yeah, I kind of answered it earlier. Uh, sorry, I didn't mark it, I'm sorry. Uh, yeah, you you will just have to do it one by one, sadly. Um, you try to find a com you look at your data frame. You can rearrange it so you can put them put them next to each other, but if you're gonna do that, might as well just select them one by one. Uh, okay. What about if I wanted to count the same exact things that I did earlier, but only for people that identify or identify, the people that reported being Latinx, Latina, Latina, Latino. So we're gonna use these functions over here. Um, the main difference compared to the previous one is that we're gonna use the function filter. So the function filter, what it does, it keeps in whatever you tell it there. Um, sometimes people are like, I'm filtering things out. You're actually filtering in. So I'm gonna filter or keep those rows where the Latin status equals yes. So that first thing, so if I just run data over here, these are all my people. This is all my data frame. Um, my whole data frame has no yes, and I think there is a I don't want to respond. So if I do the filtering and only keep the rows with a yes, I should have only those who respond a yes. And indeed I do. Of course, there's only 18 rather than 83 responses because less people say yes to this question. And then I do what I did in the last exercise. I group it by gender and age group. I count the rows. Then I ungroup it because I want to create a table. And now I have the count for gender and age group for people who are Latino, Latinx, Latina, and Latina. Um, there's only one who said prefer not to say, and that person was from 35 to 44 in terms of gender, and one if that person was uh, Latin, from Latin status. Cool. Let's see. So now another exercise that we could do is that when I was creating this survey, I wanted to create a question that was very ambiguous and pretty much bad. So that's what I did when I asked for the state question. Um, I assume in that question that everyone was from the US, clearly they're not. Uh, I didn't give any parameters on how I, I wanted the response to give their answer. So they could have put Kentucky, the whole like spelled out or Kentucky KY or 
whatever they wanted to spell it. So it was a very bad question. So I always think about when you're creating your surveys or um, I guess surveys are the main things, um, to think about the data cleaning process too, uh, if it's going to make your life a lot harder and how you can make it more efficient. Of course, you can not only have to solely base it on will it make your life easier when you're data cleaning it, but keep that in mind whenever you're doing it because you'll be surprised how many times you're like, oh, I wish I could go back in time and ask this question differently because people make typos, people make mistakes and misinterpret your uh, question. Actually, one of them, I love it. Uh, I, in the question where I asked which state you reside on uh, or in, um, someone responded depressed. I was like, well, that is a state of being, I guess. I definitely did not do a good question here, which was the, the goal, and that was great. So let's clean that state uh, variable because it has a lot of weird things going on there. If we just explore this variable right now, um, if I select the, the variable state, you see all the responses here, California, Arizona, Texas, but they're like very not the same way. Sometimes I have New York City and sometimes New York, Ontario, Canada. I clearly did not do a good job with this question. And if I use this function called unique, it will allow me to see the unique responses for that variable. So I don't have to scroll through all the repeated versions. But apparently, there's 51 unique responses. Um, many of them, yeah, depression. Uh, Peru, yay. I'm from Bolivia. That's exciting. So what we're going to do, we're going to use a function mutate to clean this variable a little bit. So I'm going to call my data frame, then I'm going to use the function mutate. What mutate allows you to do, it's, it allows you to create new columns or modify the columns that you already have. So right now, I'm going to create a new column, just in case I mess up. So I'm going to call it a state underscore new. And I'm going to use another function inside of that function. I'm going to use the case underscore when function. That function, I don't know if you're familiar in Excel, kind of like the if statement. If x equals blank, do this. Otherwise, do this other thing. So that's what case underscore when is like. So any times you find a case when a state, the variable state, equals in, in R conditionals, um, you have to use double equal or less than, more than. If you want it to be non-equal, it will have to be an exclamation mark and equal. So if a state equal the whole word California, then that's that the tilde is doing. I want you to replace it with CA. If you find a case, that's what I'm telling R, if you find a case in that a state equals the whole word of Arizona, I want you to replace it with AZ, same, same old. In this case, I said, if you find a case when the state variable equals New York City or equals New York, I want you to make it NY. And I, I like, this was, I could have maybe come up with an easier way where I can pair it. Like if you find Arizona, the state in this data frame, give it the, the abbreviation. Oh, uh, this is a lot simpler. Oh, it's a lot more work. I have to do that manually for every single unique aspect, but it does a job. At the end of the day, it does the job. Um, another way here that I did is like, okay, at the end, if you find a case when a state variable matches any of the variables in, that's what this guy is doing, the percent in percent, is looking for the variables inside a list. So if a state variable matches any of these variables that I'm giving you in a list, I want you to make them NA. If it doesn't fit any of those things, because this was a big, I had to clean a lot of it, that's what the true is, then I want you to just give whatever value was in a state. So if I run this, 
And then let me find this guy. I should have at the very end a state new column that has more like what the format of what I wanted. Since I made this code before the new responses, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna find some responses here that were not clean because I did not account for those. Yep, North Carolina, Pennsylvania, Darkin, Missouri. I, there is way more variety than I thought it was gonna be. New York City, New York with a lowercase. I only accounted for New York with a capital Y. Um, so I didn't get it. Michigan, Canada, Rhode Island. Okay, so I have work to do. I need to continue cleaning it. So if I find this one in this list, I will clean for that one. Let's see if I find state that equals. And I, like again, R is very picky. So I need to copy and paste exactly what it was in there. So Pennsylvania, I cannot add an extra N and it won't replace it. Then I'm gonna make it PA. So if I run this again, I shouldn't have Pennsylvania anymore in here. And I, I still need to continue cleaning because clearly there's more states in there that were not clean. So PA is here. Yay, PA is no longer there. Where is India? I also took India out. To the group. And it, like Germany, India, Texas. Texas, I don't know why it's not. Oh yeah, I didn't do Texas. So, so I will have to do each, like each of those cleanings because my, my question was meant to be bad and it, it is bad. <laughs> it allows for a lot more data cleaning, which is a step that you normally have to do. Uh, I will assign this to my object so it can get added there when I see it later. And I can even make account of the state from the new variable and make it a table to see how it looks like. Uh, again, I did not clean Canada, so can is still showing up there. I will need to clean it and modify it. Germany is still showing up there. North Carolina is the whole name. So there's a lot of cleaning that should happen here, but you continue doing this mutate function with more conditionals where if it equals this specific text, then I want you to replace it with this specific text. There are other ways that you can do it for sure. This is one way of doing that. You can also calculate usually the average and the standard deviations of things. That's a very common thing. Uh, for, uh, let me see if I should address this question first. So uh, Anonymous asks, sorry, I didn't understand why you ungroup at the end of this code. Also, what if you wanted to unfilter it after for other analysis? Yes, that's a very good thing. If you, I, what I would do when I want to filter things out for a specific content or questions, like if I want to do the Latino uh, question again, uh, if I'm going to use it later on, I will assign it to another object. I will do data underscore Latino because uh, that would be my data frame for the Latino population. Um, and that will only have those filter rows. I don't have to assign it to any object because I could just keep it here and it will export as an output, but it will modify anything from my object because I didn't assign it to anything. I didn't do the assignation with my arrows. Um, well, the other question is like, why did I ungroup it? That's a very good question. Um, so what I'm telling you here is like, anything that you do after this pipe, it's going to be done grouped. That's the default, unless you ungroup it. So if I don't ungroup it, you see, see how it looks like pretty, this is organized sort of, not that ugly, but if I don't ungroup it, then what it's gonna try to do is gonna create a table per female, per age, every single time, like it was grouped. So it doesn't look like a table at all um, because the GT, which is I'm telling it to create a uh, a table, a pretty table, is doing it for every variable inside of this group by function. 
So I need to make sure that before I make it a table, I ungroup it. So it doesn't give me multiple mini tables attached to each other, but it gives me one consolidated table. That's why I had to ungroup it. And sometimes it doesn't matter. Sometimes I, I just need to count and I was good to go. I didn't need to ungroup it at all. Um, sometimes it will matter. Like that table, they look not pretty. Okay, let's calculate some mean and standard deviations with our continuous variables. Uh, we'll use multiple functions here. We'll use our select function. We'll do it with three variables, the book questions, the cooking questions, and the sleep questions. We'll find out what's the average and the standard deviation for those three variables. That's the goal for this exercise. So we're gonna select, we're gonna call our data frame, then I'm gonna select these three variables over here. I'm gonna do it step by step. So you see, I selected them all three. That's it. I did not see all the other ones. And I'm gonna use the function summarize. There's two versions of that. There's the Z and the S, apparently British and the American English. They both do the same thing, uh, but it's yeah, it's up to you, whichever you want to decide. There's no difference whatsoever. They just did it because of the English. And I'm gonna use the function across. So what I'm doing here is I, I'm telling it to summarize, to uh, create an average across all those rows, but not only across those rows, um, because that's the, that's the default for summarize, but across this list of variables. So I'm gonna summarize my rows across three variables. And I'm gonna calculate the mean and I'm gonna remove the NAs because if it tries to create an average with an NA in there, it will give you an error that if there is an NA, you cannot calculate an average. So you have to tell it to please remove the NAs, which is the true in here. The default is false. I have no idea why the default has to be false. I find it very annoying. I guess it helps you to figure out like, oh, there is an NA in this data frame, uh, but it's very annoying. Um, so every time that you think, you suspect you may have an ace in your average variables, you want to remove those an ace, uh, so by making it true. If I do that so far, only that section, I will end up with something like this. So it calculated the mean for books that were read so far in 2023, uh, their enjoyment of cooking and the hours of sleep. As you can see, the average was calculated, but there's so many decimals. There's just too much. So I'm going to round this. I'm going to round them by using the function mutate. Again, I'm going to across all my columns, which is that everything is doing. So across all my columns, I want you to round them by two decimals. So if I run all of that now, I should have, oh, where did, I, where did it go? I should have the same numbers, just rounded by two decimals. Uh, so I did that and I'm gonna assign it to the mean data frame so I can keep it for my records. You see it showed up here. And I'm gonna do the same for standard deviation. The only difference that I changed, I already have my code. I just changed instead of mean SD because I want my standard deviation. And I call the SD data frame. Should show up here. And yes, that's what I have. So this is a more advanced way to do both of the things we did earlier, but in one code chunk. So if you want to just explore it, it's just functions inside functions inside functions. Um, but you instead of doing two, you could have done it in just one. So after I calculate these two data frames with the means and the standard deviations, I'm gonna create a paragraph that updates its numbers if we get new data. So I'm gonna use embedded code, which is one of the biggest perks from using RMD files, is that you can have in-text code uh, that updates with your data set. So out of the 
I use the tilde R because I'm telling you that whatever code is in here is going to be in R language and tilde that notifies that the embedded code it's done. It started here and ended here. And I told it to count the number of rows in my data frame called data. So out of the blank, which should in theory say 83 responses we received, the average number of books people have read so far this 2023 was, and I inserted here, remember my means data frame, this is a table. So X and Y. So X, uh, y, X is a row, so there's only one row, so all of them are gonna be one. And their Y's, the variables will be one, two, or three. So if I want to know the books, it will be one comma one. If I want to do the hours average, it will be one comma three based on my, and if I want to do a cooking, it will be one comma two because it's row one, column two. And that whenever I need to, in this text, you only see coding here. Oh, let's see, it's loading. Why is not showing up? 247. Yay, errors. Hmm. I don't know why. Means data frame. Uh, because I called it differently. It was means data frame, not mean data frame. Okay. So this is what I exported so far. Again, I told it to give me the code. So you will see codes in here and text and the outputs with my tables that are prettier now. And you'll see that all the states that I still need to clean, but this is a summary paragraph that I was telling you about. So it automatically gave me the number of rows of responses that we received. The average number of books people have read so far, this 2023 was 8.68 books with standard deviation of 11.28. Participants also reported sleeping 6.71 hours on average with 1.18 standard deviation. In fact, the shortest reported number was three and the longest was nine hours. Nice, but also bad, three hours, that's so little. Finally, when they were asked to report how much they enjoy cooking, one hated and 10 love it, the average score was six with a standard deviation of 2.45. So we created all of that and it will update with whenever I create a new data frame, I have more responses, those numbers will update the next time I export it. I just need to load the right data frame. That's one of the perks of using RMD. Okay, questions? Mm. I always run out of these. Uh, Christina, that is an APA format. Yes. Uh, well, this one specific, I made it APA format manually, but you could import a template from the package Papaya, and that one has the, the APA 6 edition format for a manuscript ready for you to just like insert the text. And it's called PAPAJA. That's the package. And it just, oh, not just, maybe a year ago. I still get excited. But for many years, it was, they created it, but it wasn't accepted to see run until last year that it got accepted to see run. So now it's like official, an official package. Okay, let's very quickly visualize the frequency of chosen superpowers uh, using the ggplot. I'm sorry we couldn't like go in depth in terms of this. Um, ggplot specifically, maybe we can have a workshop in the future where we actually go completely in depth of how to make graphs, how to change colors, how to change how the numbers show up, 
change font sizes and everything like that. I think there's always a lot that you can do in GG Plus and it looks fantastic, but sometimes you spend way more time than you need to to make something very little. Um, but Digiplot in general is based on the grammar of graphics. Um, a regular graph will normally need three main components. It needs a data set, a coordinate system. So like X means this variable and Y means this variable. Um, they normally the default is the Cartesian co coordinate system with the X, Y, but you can make 3D graphs too, which I don't recommend. They don't look that pretty either. <laughs> And uh, it needs geoms. So what geoms are refers to what actually you are you see in the plot. So sometimes you see points like the scatter plots, or lines like the line graphs, or polygons or bars like histograms. Uh, those are geoms, and they have they all start with geom underscore, and then there's many options that you can explore. So the usual code that you see for this is. Digiplot, even though the package is digiplot2, the function is digiplot, not with the two. So digiplot, then the data frame that you're going to be using for that visualization, then you, you do that as assignation of what the X and the Ys are. So X of that graph is going to be height and Y is going to be weight. And the color of whatever uh, the, the data points, it's going to be based on the variables in the column page. And the type of graph that I'm telling you here to make, it's a it's color plot. It's a geom underscore point. It's just, we're going to see dots. So that's what this code is saying that it's supposed to do. So let's try to graph our own like variable of superpowers building a histogram. And we may be like um, 10, 15 minutes late than our ending of three. So feel free to uh, leave, um, ask questions, or just uh, I'll be, the recording will be sent to you whenever we are done. I uh, just want to finish this graphing so you can see how it will look like. So if we're going to graph the superpowers as a histogram, for example, we'll use the function ggplot. My data will come from the, from the data frame called data. And I want my x to be superpowers. The x axis of my graph will be my variable called superpower. And the color of the bars of this histogram will be called, will be based on how many unique variables superpower variable has. And the fill, it's the color of the inside color of my bars will be also coming from that superpower variable unique values. And to make a histogram, I'm going to use a geom underscore bar. So if I run it, I will end up with something like this. If I don't specify the fill, you'll see why it's important. Oh, what did I do? I didn't leave that one. It did if, it only did the outline because that's what color is. The color is for the outlines and the lines, and fill is for the space inside. So I don't want a graph like this. I want the actual bars to be fill up. So something like this. We could clean it a little bit and use a theme called minimal. Um, but the default of that function is that it will get rid of the background to clean it a little bit more. So if I run it, it will look more like a minimal, minimal graph. If I visualize two continuous variables for like a scatter plot, I'll use X and specify that I want my hours of sleep in that uh, in, in that axis, and I want my Y to be books. And I want the color of the dots in there to be based on the age groups. So if I run this, you see the colors will be based on the age group, but you see it plotted for hours of sleep on books. So we see the person who read 50 books, but normally it sleeps like six hours. And that person was in between 18 to 24. That's cool. Um, you can also, instead of having a like age groups like this uh, to figure out which one is with what, I can use the function facet wrap and what that will do to my graph is that it will create different facets or panels 
for the different variables or the, the different content inside my variable age group. So I have three, four, five unique um, items inside a variable, 18 to 24, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll create a panel for each one of them. And since I kept the color age group, each panel has its own color. So there's only one between 45 to 54, and that person has read five books, uh, but only slept for like seven hours. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Uh, so thank you so much for those I've stayed. Uh, so those are the graph. And the, once you export it all, you get a report like this. And you get your graphs at the very end. Um, you see it all like a report, but you still see your code, which is like, I don't, I don't want, and my PI, my collaborators, they don't need to see my report. So I'm going to say echo false, rerun it. What that's gonna do, it's gonna delete my uh, my data frames. Oh, my code, I meant. And it will only have outputs. So we'll have my text, my outputs, and nothing else. They don't need to see how I made these graphs. And that's one of the, biggest advantages of using an RMD file. So last, I just wanted to walk you through a couple of resources that you can use um, in general and your learning of R. Uh, Twitter um, or X now has wonderful accounts that you could follow. These are people that actually are working full time sometimes in like R. Um, to to make R more accessible and create new packages and things more um, integrated for like, different languages like R and Python and how to make art with R, not just like data analysis or data cleaning. There's a couple of resources that you can go to. Um, I have a website of resources and websites that you can look at. Uh, I accumulate all the resources I find, especially if they're free, books, slides, presentations, uh, interactive courses, things like that uh, for different topics. And you can go and explore and see uh, if anyone will like help you. Some of them actually only has statistics with R as a tool uh, rather than teaching you R. Um, you can also visit the RStudio Education site. They have their own branch in RStudio. That it's the whole purpose of these people is to educate and teach beginners how to use R in RStudio. Um, you can also visit Crystal Lewis uh, website and you have access to these slides. And she kind of like accumulates functions that has helped her do data cleaning. She works in the education realm. Uh, so she does a lot of data cleaning for education data sets. Uh, so she just puts them all together there for her future self and everyone apparently. <laughs> And more than anything, have fun. Um, it is frustrating at the very beginning. There is a lot to learn, uh, but it does get better. Um, we're always happy to, like the entire community is happy to help you out whenever you encounter any obstacle in your learning path. Uh, so always reach out, feel free to ask questions, use resources uh, are available out there. One of the things my RAs, I've been teaching them how to use is ChatGPT to use, uh, how to read the outputs from ChatGPT and what they can do with it. Sometimes it's asking the right, right question, um, know where you're asking it, the issue. Uh, you, you can have um, these wonderful databases of answers, but it's like how, if you don't ask the right question, it makes it a lot harder to solve your issue. So we're all happy to help. And thank you so much for staying all the way to the end. And thank you for attending this uh, workshop. That was very rushed because we only had two hours and there was so much to cover. But I hope you've learned something, um, but I appreciate you all. Oh, thank you, Jasmine. That's so nice to hear. I appreciate that. <laughs> it helps to know that at least I helped someone. <laughs> but thank you so much. And um, yeah, visit Black and Psych, our Twitter account, our website. You get an email from all of us where we're going to be asking you more feedback, um, how 
what things we can do for you all and how we can improve these workshops. Maybe we do need to make it longer. So please let us know. But thank you so much.